I'm delayed. I just, you know, just looked at the know. screen <laughs> and I saw myself <laughs> walking towards you. Yeah. Oh, it's like, uh, yeah, I think it's like a, oh, it's 40 seconds. Right? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, it's missing. Um, it's very strange to see yourself in the past. Yeah. Really yeah. Past. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello everyone, um, we're at uh, session 406, uh, Cities and Simulacra, Simulacra and Interactive Comics Destruction um, in person. Um, today we're joined by uh, uh, Lawrence Grove and Frank Quietly um, for this talk and presentation. Lawrence Grove is a professor of French and text image studies and director of the Sterling Maxwell Center of the Study of Text Image, Cultures and the History at the University of Glasgow. His research focuses on historical aspects of text image forms, and in particular, bande dessinée, uh, as the renowned comic artist Frank Quietly presents a time-lapse recording of his illustration of Metropolis. It is, as it is created and des then destroyed, Lawrence Grove will theorize and examine Frank Quietly's process. Frank Quietly was born in Glasgow in 1968 of Vincent Dagan, but realizing that, quite frankly, his work might offend his family, he hid behind the Spoonerism pen name. In 1996, he started working for DC, <coughs> initially on Flex Mentala, before going on to the Sandman, Pax Americana, and W3. Uh, Frank Quietly's output is vast and varied, but for many, it is the Superman and Batman duo that makes him the boy wonder of comics. He will present a time-lapse recording of his illustration of a metropolis as it is created and then destroyed. Thank you, and welcome. Okay, well, thank you ag again, and it's thank, thank you, Russell. Thank you to, to the conference organizers. It's, it is a real pleasure to be in this city of sin. Um, I guess that's what it's for. So, we'll be doing this in a sort of a very informal way between me and Frank Quietly, and that I'll be giving some of the boring theory background stuff, and then Frank Quietly will be doing the interesting drawing stuff. But it's intended to be an interactive destruction, so please do 
interrupt, ask questions. Um, it's very much a to and fro thing. That, that's how we're hoping this will work. So, um, you should have a handout which will give you the, uh, the overview of how we're going to be doing this and a little bit of bibliography, but uh, just to tease a little bit, the bibliography doesn't include many of the Frank Quietly works, so if you want to know more about the works he's going to show you, you're going to have to ask him. Um, Jean Baudrillard, um, whom I suspect all of, most of you will know, Jean Baudrillard um, opens his Simulacre et Simulation, which is translated as uh, Simulacre and Simulation. He, he opens it with a quote from the Bible, so that fits in with our theme from uh, Ecclesiastics. So this is the quote I've got on here. Le Simulacre n'est jamais... Ce qui cache la vérité, c'est la vérité qui cache qu'il n'y en a pas. Le simulacre est vrai. The simulacrum is never what hides the truth, it's the truth that hides the fact that there is none. The simulacrum is true. Um, just in passing to point out that, that Baudrillard once gave a talk in Whiskey Pete's, which if, if you're driving in from California, it's on the border between California and Nevada. So he once gave a apparently quite an interesting interactive discussion between philosophical theory and the other delights of Whiskey Pete. Um, also to point out that there is, and I haven't had a chance to see this, have any of you seen it? There's a statue in downtown Las Vegas called Monument to the Simulacrum. It's, that's, that's a picture of it at the bottom right, the plaque that goes to it, um, telling us all about Jean Baudrillard. Um, but to return to the main point, the simulacrum then is a false creation. It's, uh, it, it, it's an imagined world that can supersede reality, which becomes reality itself. So some things, when you invent them, become more real than the real world. So the main example Baudrillard gives is Disneyland, but he, he also refers to Los Angeles and to the American cities that surround it. And I think you couldn't get a better example of a simulacrum than, than, than Las Vegas, um, to which he refers to as referring, as, 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 as rising from the desert. He also refers to Las Vegas as the whore on the other side of the desert. So you can take the definition by Baudrillard as you wish. Another critic from a similar era is Umberto Eco of the Name of the Rose fame, who refers to Las, Las Vegas as well in his Travels in Hyperreality, which dates from 1975. Hyperreality is taking simulacra one step further. It's creating an imaginary world which then goes even further than the real world. And one example he gives is Superman's Fortress of Solitude. And here we have one example of a recent version of Superman's Fortress of Solitude. In terms of comics, they are the perfect medium for creating such imagined cityscapes, which create the reality of our imagination, going far beyond reality, but without the need for planning permission, for architectural materials, or for estate agents. So let me give you a few examples now. Cities and simulacra, some comic examples. Or just a very quick, a few very quick examples before getting on to the really interesting stuff, which is the Frank Quietly stuff. Little Nemo in, Sun, in Slumberland by Winsor McKay dates from between 1905 and 1911, depending on which strip you get. Um, and it, it works via the trope of the dream world. McKay creates fantastic um, cityscapes, imagined cityscapes, but he also destroys them, as in this one on the last days of Manhattan.
This example is probably one of the better known ones. It's RG Laferre Tournesol. And what we have in Laferre Tournesol is this creation of the city sudden by this science type ray gun gets destroyed. So it is this destruction of a simulacra of a city. But the way that this works, the way the comic works, is that you turn the page and you physically see that the city has only been a model then to be destroyed as an example. So um, it involves the creation of a simul simulacrum city um, the object of a city destroying secret weapon. Um, however, when we turn the page, we see that the simulacra is in fact a simulacrum. It's just a model of a model. So you can keep going like this, and it gets quite playful. Simulacra are playful. That's the very nature of the thing. This is, of course, however slightly dark because it's an, from an album which dates to 1956 at the height of the Cold War when the reality was far was more than real in terms of the destructions of cities and not just fake cities. In terms of reality, more recently Fab Caro have, have any of you I've got the album here have any of you heard of Fab Caro? He's a contemporary uh, author from, from Montpellier, from the south of France. He's, he's done very little traditional publicity, but he's managed to become a superstar through blogs, through word of mouth. This particular one, the Carnet du Peru, describes a journey which the author goes on throughout Peru and the creation of various city-states, such as Cusco or Lima in Peru. You may have noticed, however, at the bottom right, there's something strange about the inhabitants of Peru. And yes, we get to the bit where Fab Cabo's partner tells him, you're not draw drawing Peruvians, you've been drawing Mexicans. Um, Fab Cabo has never been to Peru. He never will go, according to this. Um, Although the, black, the, the back cover blurb says it's the parcours d'un homme uh, uh, profondément remoué dans ses fondements, so it's the travel of a man who's thoroughly shaken in his foundations, this is a journey of a man that has never happened. Um, the foundations of the city, of these ancient venerable civilizations, um, not least because the author, as I said, has never set foot in Peru and never will. Of the utopic bande dessinée French comics, probably best known are the cities created by François Schoyten and Benoît Peters. as, a, as a, a, a network of obscure cities, these city obscure, which involves different architectural motifs, as in La Tour that we have here, um, which includes the Tower of Babel, or Bruxelles, spelt like Brussels, but it isn't Brussels because it's a parallel city. So throughout this network, we get these parallel cities which take us into another world. And the authors encourage us to write in when we see a passageway which does lead us to this parallel world. And I, I've already seen a few in, in Las Vegas, which I think are leading to parallel worlds. Um, they, then, they also set up a web network at a time when web networks didn't really exist. This was way back in the, in the 90s. And had an album which was interactive in the, 
the cutting edge technology of the time. Yes, it had a DVD. So it's truly three-dimensional interactive creation of these fake cities that then went on to stage shows, to museum exhibits, to uh, the book that involves the DVD, to a guide of the city, and as some of you will, will know, even in Paris there's a subway station, which is Alzimitié, which fits in with this whole network. This was from 1983 to 2008, with this series of imaginary cityscapes and parallels in the real world. Comics, but also multimedia, going from reality onto simulacrum, onto a simulacrum world, early in the days of such things existing. Any, any questions so far before and, and this is the website. Any? So. This is the bit you've been waiting for, I think. The cityscapes of Frank Quietly. Notwithstanding, these are surely some of the best examples of the simulacra of today. One I have mentioned so far by Frank Quietly is the Fortress of Solitude that appears in All-Star Superman. Um, and again, as I say, this is the only actual reference you've got in my handout. For the rest of them, you'll have to ask him, um, which I think is a, a lot better way to get the details, um, to ask the ar art architect. But um, again, the destruction occurs with this one taken from Jupiter's Legacy, which I'm sure you know through the Netflix field. So without further ado, Frank Quietly, here he is to tell you about some of the cityscapes he's destroyed. So, okay. Um, so this is a page of one of my moleskins. Um, I keep these little books and whether I'm working from a script or simply working on a piece for myself or for a, a client, pretty much everything starts with this this process of getting the ideas that come from the initial conversation or come from the script from my head onto the paper. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a falseness here straight away, and this is, this is, the, this is the, the, the workings out, this is the, the, the kind of background to how I create these generally false things. Um, this, is a, this is a page from Jupiter's Legacy um, and it's a, a fight on a hillside um, and this character is proving proving difficult to to subdue and one of our protagonists uses he's got a kind of psychic ability to to create realities or false realities that um, that he can use to to control other people. So the bottom panel of this, they're, they're fighting on a, a hillside and then the, the gradient of the hillside actually becomes the, the gradient of the seabed underneath the, the bad guy. Um, in the script, Mark Miller, the writer, had asked me to, to depict the, the antagonist getting trapped in a psychic cell. And I was thinking of both prison cell and animation cell. And given that the, the character at the top of the page is, um, is creating this false reality using um, his own memory and imagination, which is pretty much the way, the way I work um, as well, um, what I decided to do to try and help sell the idea of, of um, what's going on I displayed my own process. So round the, the outside of the, the image, we've got a, 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 a light blue, non-repro blue pencil sketch with a little more detail added. And as we go into the, 
the sides of the cell, which is just a single point perspective cube, uh, we see a little bit of colour rough being intro introduced to, to inform the colourist of the kind of thing that I'm after. And as we go in towards the centre of the image, um, it becomes the artwork becomes as real as the figures um, that are occupying it, uh, which helps sell the idea that the, the, uh, the antagonist would be suitably convinced um, by his surroundings. Um, this is a really old piece of work. Um, it, was, um, a it was written by Grant Morrison. It's for a comic book called Flex Mentalo, and Grant described a nightmare fairy tale type depiction of a place that looks like one of the fishing villages of Cornwall, or you know, down in the the, the, the southwest of England. Um, he wanted everything exaggerated. He wanted the the buildings all twisted, and he wanted a a cathedral at the top of the hill. So it was, a, it was an imagined landscape from his mind and he based this on memories of a childhood holiday, that, vacation that he had had um, with, his, with his parents when he was about 10 years old. And Grant's a few years um, older than me, but I also had a family holiday in Cornwall when I was about 10 years old. and. Um, with only a, a fairly scant description in the script, um, I came up with this image, which, as it transpires, was exactly what Grant was wanting. Um, this is from Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Um, it's one of Sandman's siblings, Sandman being like Dream, as he's also known. Um, one of his siblings is Destiny, who carries the Book of Destiny. And each of the siblings has a different realm that they, that they live in. And Destiny's realm has everything that's ever existed in it, and um, as does his, his book. And it's constantly shifting. And he chooses to move through parts that are made of mazes and tunnels and different pieces of architecture from different places around the world and different eras. Um, this is um, this is the the pencil drawing for a double page spread from a comic called Pax Americana. Um, this is the way it looks when it's lettered and coloured. But the reason I put the this um, pencil drawing in first because it's slightly easier to see that um, we don't have the, the gutters, as they're called, the spaces between the, the individual frames. Um, it's one large room with a number of big um, sculptural pieces in it. And any, any room or city or landscape that I draw from my imagination um, is basically a it's basically a, a set for for the a place for this, the story to happen. Um, what's different about this is that it was Grant Morrison again that I was working with. Um, he had this idea that we could have a double page spread, and there are three different stories happening in the one physical space. Um, there's a hero and his partner, and she's trying to convince him not to leave, and it's set in the morning time. Um, there's a her left alone in the house, and an intruder gets in and murders her, and that's the, the red panels. And then after the police investigation, another character comes in with a torch and a dictaphone, and goes around piecing together what actually happened. Um, so unlike the, the normal false realities that I create for telling stories, this one also had a thing that you can really only do in comics, uh, which is have three different storylines happening in the one physical space 
over three different days. Um, and this, um, there's a, my local comic book store in Glasgow is uh, it's one of the Forbidden Planets. They're a small chain, and um, they they've they've just they've just moved to much bigger premises, and. Uh, there's an upstairs, and one of these characters, the one near the centre, is just about to go up the stairs. And that wall behind that character um, in the in the comic book store, I made six pieces of artwork um, to go in the walls, and this was one of them. And each of the others is uh, an example of a different genre of comics. So there's an old-fashioned kind of 1950s war comic, uh, just like a a phony panel from a comic that doesn't actually exist. Um, there's a, a kind of, there's a, a, what looks like a Jack Kirby drawing of the Hulk, but he's holding a, a, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and he's horrified to find out these derivative. Um, so each of the, there's a manga one, there's a, there's a superhero one. Um, so each of them has a kind of joke or punchline, and, this one, I used, um, I, I took photographs of the inside of the shop and I, and, uh, I used Google Maps for the, the street outside and I came up with this thing at some point in the future after some unnamed catastrophe and I was going to, I told Jim, the, the owner of the shop, I told him that um, the punch that because I, I showed him the roughs from my mole skin, so I told him the punchline for this one was going to be along the lines of like they had uh, they had miscalibrated the the time machine and they'd, they'd missed the closing down sale. And Jim was like, I know it's I know it's silly, but I, I don't like a joke about a closing down sale in my new shop, so we actually left that one blank and we're going to do a caption competition for the uh for the, the customers. So, um, okay, I'm gonna hand you back over to the good professor and I'll get on with the drawing. Thank you. It's a bit hard to follow that really, isn't it? So, I think all, all, I, all I'm trying to do is to draw, put together a few con conclusions. Theoretical conclusion, an, an interactive destruction. Um, for cities and simulacra, or cities that are simulacra, we can build them how we want, but we can also destroy them. Which, ironically, is not necessarily a negative thing. It allows for a tabula rasa, a clean slate, a starting over. In his Discours de la méthode of 1637, René Descartes refers to the undesirability of a work of several authors, of course, unless it's Vin and myself. Um, and here we might think of the effect of a Tower of Babel. If you get too many people in giving their opinions, then you end up, it's a bit like meetings, with a mishmash rather than with a single creation. Where you are best destroying in order to rebuild. Building from nothing, which is, of course, the very basis of a city in the middle of a desert. However, wherein lies, in my opinion, the difference between real cities, whatever that means, and simulacra cities. We can and will do an interactive destruction, and that can work for comics. But it is the eternal city the external city, and here I'm saying eternal and external, not because they last forever, but because you cannot just scroll them up or draw over them. And I'm saying external rather than real, because part of the theories of Jean Baudrillard are to ask, well, what do we mean by real anyway? But it is the external city that is truly act interactive. Any city, no matter what destruction 
natural disasters, war, or town planners can reap is truly a palimpsest. A city is made up of different layers, and we might see that in Venice, where we think, well, this is the perfect example of a 16th and 17th century city that has stood through time, but when we actually look at, at Venice, we see modern day boats, modern day tourists. There is no such thing as a, a real external city. Each city is made up of fake layers, and there is surely no better example of a palimpsest city, one of made up of fake layers that give different styles and time periods than Las Vegas itself. That's all I want to say. The, interac the, the interactive practical conclusion is the destruction of a comic city. And it allows us, again ironically, to destroy and to consider our methods of construction. So there is no one better to create a fake city than Frank Quietly. Um, as if by magic, here he has done it. Now how do you finish a talk about a fake world? Initially when we thought this through, we thought, well, then Frank Quietly would create this fake city and we'd then destroy it. We thought, well, how do we destroy it? Do we scribble over it? Does he draw flames coming out of it? Or does he just scrawl it up in a ball and throw it to you as if a bridesmaid at a wedding and see who gets it? <laughs> so the best answer to the fake city is for you to decide. What do you want us to do with this fake city? So there we are. Any suggestions for destruction? How we go about it? What we do with it? Or do we keep it? Okay, well that's that, that's it. We, we, we have ended our trip into the imaginary through an imaginary ending because the imaginary ending, as you can see, is no more existent than the cities that I've been presenting to you. Thank you very much. So basically, quick questions to, to Frank Quietly on how he does his work. Um, what we should do with this fake city, which is pretty good, I think. So, so in, a, in a true university conference, what I should be doing is analysing this and telling him where he's gone wrong on it. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's have a look, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you, you've got um, you've got the classical Greek. Um, are they Corinthian pillars? They are. Indeed. They are Corinthian pillars. Then you've got the sort of Roman-style aqueduct. You've got a a pre. A, well, a, would that be a, a Bronze Age type dwelling? And then we yeah. go on to the Gothic. Um, I can't criticise that. It's, <laughs> <laughs> you, me, you you do it. How do you? So what are the cities that are most, you know, what are the architectures that we most love to see destroyed? So again, in, in the uh, Schwitten and Peters, the, the La Tour, yeah. which I think is back there, they, one of the things they do is to create different types of architecture which builds upon it. And as you say, it does tend to have uh, classical Roman architecture and then Gothic architecture, which dominates. So is that the architecture that we all think of. I mean, I guess Las Vegas, what is there other than Caesar's Palace, which um, the, the Veni is the Eiffel Tower, the new classic. Um, you, you're asking some very good questions, <laughs> but I'm not sure I can answer these. But I think, I think that's a good point, is that when we think of fake architecture, it comes back to the earliest of so-called real architecture, which is the, the architecture of the classical period and of the Middle Ages. Which, uh, upon which all of our values seem to be based, yeah. It, 
Does that mean? <laughs> yeah. You see that now that I've done it with a sharpie. <laughs> we need white out. And then you can sell it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your your comment about the superimposing of architecture in some way is, is what people might define as postmodern architecture, in that you take a building that is visibly modern, but you refer to the past. Yeah, I'm thinking of the excitement for me about, you know, modernism, so much of this is about this embrace of speed and the fantasy of the future. I mean, this is bad in our native language, <laughs> but just that excitement that we could make it new and make it better. Yeah. Le Corbusier, as you're saying about modernist architecture, which is the very creation of this dream world, this dream city. Um, and interestingly enough, he used comic strips to plan his architecture. He would draw the equivalent of sto storyboards. Um, but, I mean, okay, some of the most famous Le Corbusier pieces are left, but a lot have been destroyed, and those who imitated him are often felt to be out of place and outdated and, and unlivable. architectural pieces were all based on the notion of the characters going off on, on into a dream world. Yeah. Um, Vin, have you got anything to say about dreams in this? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't actually hear the question. About dream, dream architecture, that often um, imaginary architecture is linked to, to, to the notion of a, of a dream world. Um, just the when, when you see dream worlds in, um, in comic books, in art, in film, uh, when you hear them described in literature, they tend, they tend to seem familiar to most of us because they have a fluidity. Um, often they're based in childhood fears or real places, um, but they tend to they tend to kind of um, they, t they tend to be constantly changing, um, and I mean, like it's very common to dream that you're in your own house, and then you walk up the stairs, and you're in your school, and you know you walk back down the stairs, and you you're somewhere where you went on holiday. So there's that kind of from an artistic point of view, that's actually very satisfying because you're kind of free-forming without any real rules, you know? Um, so that, for me, that's always a satisfying thing to have to, to, to depict. Other questions or comments? Or?
I think the I think the the difficulty of comparing it with um, we three, and I, I think I know the image you're talking about. It's like the, the, the suitcase is around the, 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 the small the little uh, the video surveillance Yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah, uh-huh. Um, I don't have that example to hand, unfortunately, um, but there was a, it was a slightly different, it was a slightly different way of going about it from what I was doing here, but I had a six page sequence um, that had, I think, 18 or 24 panels per page. So it was lots of tiny panels, and um, it was basically there was um, the animals. It was all set inside a a big military complex, and each of the the, the panels was a, a CCTV screen, and there was a couple of different threads of story going on and I kept going back and forward between different cameras and different corridors and rooms within the and just outside the the building and um, so it, it became it became really complicated because this is an imaginary building that I've got in here and I'm making the action happen you know like um, and following different characters using all the different cameras that I'd placed around the building. Um, and normally what I do, like um, when you saw my moleskin sketches, I tend to just work things out like this. And it looks it, it looks complicated for people who don't know what's going on. But funnily enough, this, the, this particular one um, is a cross section of a, an apartment block where I had um, different stories going on in, in different apartments and the various um, protagonists pass each other on the stairwell. Um, but because there was so many frames and there was so many different imaginary cameras, cameras around this imaginary building, it became too difficult to work out, like just drawing it out as tiny thumbnails. Um, and I ended up drawing all the thumbnails individually and cutting them out so that I could actually move them around and work it out. And uh, I've told this story before, but um, I, I kept all the I kept all the the cutouts in a in a sun made raisin box, and um, and it I spent I spent about two weeks just working out how best to lay out this six page sequence, and. Um, so each day I would open this raisin box and I'd put them out and I'd make notes and you know I was building up the page layouts based on these cutouts, and then one day the raisin box disappeared and I said to my my wife I said <laughs> I said have you seen a raisin box and she went the really old grubby one yeah I threw it in the bin, <laughs> and uh, fortunately it was just the the bin in the kitchen and it was still there, and I said Anne that's two weeks work in that raisin box. <laughs> And she just looked at me and shook her head and she's like, nobody keeps two weeks work in a raisin box. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have the example to hand, but that's, that was the different approach. <laughs> the destruction's coming. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I was thinking maybe um, in terms of the structure, how about we cut it into pieces for everyone? So we, we would cut it into, let's say, the number of people that are here. 30. Which would that imply that at some stage we would all have to reunite in order to put the thing back well, together? That's an interesting thing about, I mean, art in general. When you take art out of a context, like if you if 
you take a page out of a book and sell it at a book dealer to be framed, is, does it then lose its value if you change it, if you take it away from its original context? If you've got a Renaissance altarpiece that you put in the cloisters in New York, is it still a Renaissance altarpiece? take it one step further and say it's it's only context that makes reality. There is no reality, I mean, not wishing to get too teleological, but there's no reality other than the context that we put whatever we're doing in. Having got onto the meaning of life, is there anything more? <laughs> Any any questions for Frank Quietly about for Vin about his the way he creates the various works his working style? Well, you've got something here is very unusual because normally a Frank Quietly artwork will take what a, a week a page or something like this. Yeah, I, two pages a week is the fastest I can ever work. So, to some extent, when it was suggested to Vin that you would create a drawing in ten minutes and destroy, <laughs> 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 I think we missed the pen with the deadline. So you're getting something extremely rare of, of seeing a Frank Quietly creation within within minutes rather than hours or days. Two really obvious examples that that everybody's heard of, like Gotham City and Metropolis, and both of them, to some extent, are a, a kind of reflection on the characters um, that look after those two cities. You know, so Superman's full of optimism and and hope and looking to the future and, and making the world better. Uh, but the, it's it's got that kind of 1950s dream utopia future kind of look about it, and Gotham is grim and gr gritty and you know, um, and the much of the the kind of focus is on the the crime that that um, that Batman's sworn to to try and eradicate. Um, there's a there's a an English comic 2000 AD, and um, it was written by a guy called a guy called John Wagner. The Judge Dredd was the main character, and um, there his version of the future was that we would ruin the planet so much that people would live in in mega cities, and it it was just these giant it was these giant cities that had amalgamated and then 
been covered up so they're actually kind of like gigantic bubbles um, to hide away from the, irra the irradiated uh, world, the, the, the mess that we've made of the planet. And it was a kind of satire on, um, no offence, um, like the kind of Americanization of the globe, uh, about the kind of fascist police state, uh, about rampant consumerism. Um, so, and it was, it was, a lot of the cities were uh, pretty humorous, um, but visually um, there was, there was always loads of, of um, jokes about and commentaries on the way things were going. And it was, it was nearly always just taking the way things actually are and just exaggerating and extrapolating that into, into a future that's supposed to be a kind of warning and a commentary and, and you know, and entertainment. Questions or comments? Okay. Well, I guess. Done. I think we need a volunteer to destroy it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, then. Destroy it, throw it out. Yeah. <laughs> Destroy it. Right, so this is it. Just that was kind of some of our earliest types of buildings where we just we just made a dwelling with with stones and I think I think we started in, in round dwellings before we, we get into the corners and then a, a step pyramid like a smooth pyramid some Greek and Roman stuff you know a mosque you know like a, I just just building up just a Drawing in different influences just to make a kind of uh, a kind of false city, and then with the island steel like skyscrapers in the background, and then the big, the biggest building furthest away is just some modern thing with emergent architectural materials we don't have yet. So um, it was just it was purely as a kind of structure to to work on. I think most people have got one. Oh, did you get one of these? The vending machine? I have a question about your um, hand yeah. Yes. Uh, 